not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defies the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let's go to the third scripture. Amos chapter 9 verse 11 to 12. On that day, I will raise up the tab tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and build it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. So let's bow down our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, before the throne of grace, O oh Lord. Lord, it's your word that we meditate and we ask of you, the Holy Spirit, who inspired these words unto the men of old, Lord. I pray the same Holy Spirit who moves among us, who dwells within us, open our eyes of understanding, enlighten, enlighten our hearts, O God, that we may see what is the true intent when you wrote these things, Father. Help us to connect the dots, to see the big picture, Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth as how Jesus talked about to the Samaritan woman. We long for you, Lord. We seek your face expectantly. Enlighten our hearts, Holy Spirit. Talk to us, Lord. Let it all make sense. Let it all come together. I pray that you who guided me through this week, the words that you inspired in my head, Lord, I pray that you will do so even among your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Just a bit of background, because um, the last two weeks I've been like, you know, meditating on being the temple of God, that I am the temple of God, you are the temple of God, that the Holy Spirit lives within us. And I've been thinking, Lord, how do we go about honoring you in this temple? Because I do remember from the Old Testament, the tabernacle and the temple, there were order of service, there were things that were according to the law that was done. But now I host the Spirit of God within me. How do I honor Him? How, how do I worship Him? I remember the words of Jesus where He said, they will worship the Father in spirit and in truth with the aid of the Holy Spirit and also the truth of the word of God according to his word. And I've been meditating this over and over. And it so happened as pastor was um, speaking on David and last week as well, the message, and it started to dawn on me. And while I was worshiping last week, suddenly the Lord brought to my mind about David. I mean, I have not thought about the tabernacle of David. In fact, I don't even know what it is. All I knew was David was a worshiper and maybe, you know, tabernacle of worship. And that's, that's all I thought. I mean, I didn't even think of it actively. And while I was standing in worship, and suddenly the Lord said, this is what I was talking about. And I couldn't hold it and I came and shared it, shared with the congregation. Then the more I thought about it, these three verses start to connect one to the other. First two verses show what you are in Christ, who you are in Christ. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a special people called to praise him. That is your calling, that is who you are. You are royal and you are a priest. You are royal, you have a kingdom to take care of, in the days, in the years, in the eternity to come. But at the same time, you are called to be a priest unto God with no distinction between men or women there. You are called to be a priest unto God. So a priest serves God in a temple or in the Old Testament, a tabernacle. Moses had a tabernacle and, and we have the temple 
um, of David and Nehemiah in the Bible we read. And priests served there. And suddenly, in the Old Testament, there were a special group of people, the Levites were only called to be priests. But here suddenly the Lord opens up the door and says, those who believe on Jesus are now both kings and priests. You're both a king and a priest. Today we're going to meditate on what does it take to be a priest and how you worship God, how you offer him services. Your kingdom duties, we can meditate another day. But today we're going to focus on what it is to be a priest unto God. And today God has said, you don't have to go build a physical tabernacle. You don't have to build a temple. But I live within you. You are my temple. The whole shift came down to you. Now you are a priest and you're also the temple. Now what is the order of service that God would like? That's what we read in Amos. Amos. And it says, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David. How the tabernacle of David functioned, that is the fashion that I would like the saints in the latter days to function. Because you see, in, in that verse you say, I will raise up in the latter days the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and repair its damages and raise up its ruins. So in the last days, God wants to raise up a group of priests who will worship him in spirit and in truth according to the fashion how David worshipped God. And in order to understand this, it is important to understand what is the tabernacle like. Because we're talking about the tabernacle of David. So hence we're just going to take a trip down the Old Testament, just to understand what is the tabernacle. The word tabernacle is in Hebrew called as mish, mishkan, which means dwelling place. Mishkans, mishkan means just dwelling place. The place where God dwells. The intent of God in originally in the Garden of Eden was he came to dwell with man. He made man, he dwelt with man. God visited every day in the evening. Jesus visited the people Adam and Eve every day in the evening. But not only that, Adam and Eve before the fall had the glory of God within them. It was like a covering over them. The glory of God dwelt in them. That's, where, that's why when they sinned, when the glory left, suddenly they realized their nakedness. What happened when they sinned? The glory departed. But the intent of God never changes. He still wants to have his glory dwell in you. That is why Jesus came and the restoration happens through faith in Jesus. Amen. When we read Revelation chapter 21 verse 3, we see the true intent of God. He says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. He himself will be with them and be their God. This is talking about in the heavens once we go up to heaven. But when you see here, the true inner of God is his dwelling is with men. His desire to live is not up in the heavens without humans. You must remember, you know, before Jesus, there was no human being up in heaven. Do you realize that? Jesus opened the door to heaven. Until then... Even Abraham and all the saints of the Old Testament were in a waiting place until Jesus took them to heaven. So until this point, you see, heaven was empty of human, humans or man altogether. And Jesus opened the door. The desire of God is to dwell with men and women. So when you see when God wanted to restore, the first time when Abraham opened his heart to God and his generation, you see, when God made a covenant with the children of Israel when he brought them out of Egypt with a mighty arm. He wanted to show that I don't just want to be your God from far off. I want to dwell with you people. I want to live among you people. I want to show my glory. I want to show my power. I want to show my authority. I want you to get familiar with me and I want to dwell with you. And that is the intent of God. And God could have just stopped with the Ten Commandments and say, here is a bunch of rules. Go and live accordingly. 
No, up in the Mount Sinai, what God showed Moses was to build a tabernacle. After he gave the rules, after he gave the Ten Commandments, he gave the rules, so he gave the pattern of how to build the tabernacle. If we read in Exodus chapter 25 verse 40, he tells Moses, he gives the pattern of how to build the tabernacle. And he shows Moses the tabernacle which is in heaven. Did you realize there is a tabernacle in heaven? The tabernacle that God asked Moses to build was fashioned according to the pattern which is in heaven. And that's why he said in Exodus chapter 25 verse 40, he said, see to it, he's reminding him again, see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. What was the pattern that was shown to Moses? It was the very pattern that is in the heavenly places. Right? So Moses built the tabernacle according to the blueprint that was given to him by God. This is what we read. You know, let me make the connection. How do I get to know there was a, a tabernacle in heaven? Hebrews chapter 8, 1 to 6. It's a bit of a reading, but it will make sense. It's good for us to read that. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 to 6. And now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected, not man. So in the heavenlies there is a tabernacle, there is a temple. The word tabernacle and temple are interchangeably used. And for every priest, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore it is necessary that this one have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said... See that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. But now he, that is Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch he is also the mediator of a better covenant which is established on the better promises. So you, you see here, Paul makes the connection and says, Moses created the tabernacle according to the pattern which is in heaven. And right now as we speak, there is a tabernacle in heaven. There is a pattern that is in heaven and we have a high priest in the heavenlies taking out the duties that was required of a high priest and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And the same thing happens when David who loved God so much, who stayed in his tabernacle so much, who desired to build a temple for God, a permanent place for God. And then when he starts to make plans, God says, listen, you know, I can't allow you to build the temple because your hands are full of blood. But I'll allow your son to build it. But I will show you the patterns. So again, the Lord reveals the full pattern of the tabernacle again to David. You will see that in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 11 to 12, and again in verse 19. Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chamber, and the place of the mercy seat, and the plans for all he had by the Spirit of God, and of the courts of the house of God, and of all the chambers around it, of the treasuries of the house of God, and the treasuries for the dedicated things. And verse 19 it says, all this said David, and the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the work of these plans. So again you see God reveals. Once again God reveals. How you're going to build me a temple? You're going to build me a tabernacle? Do it my way. And he shows again the patterns. Shows him in writing. How David has to build the temple. We know the temple was there for a period of time. And then it got destroyed when the children of Israel were carried away. To Babylon. Then what happens? God comes to Ezekiel. And while Ezekiel is a captive in the land of Babylon, 
God takes him on a three-dimensional virtual reality trip. If you read Ezekiel chapter 37 to 40, you will see how God takes him room after room, area after area, court after court, how the, the, the third temple, the second temple should look like. Takes, gives him details on what measurements it should be, how far, how high, in which direction, all of that is given to Ezekiel. So you see, three times in the Old Testament, God says, do it according to the pattern which is in the heavens. I'm not going to read all of this. You can go and read it later. In the same Ezekiel chapter 45, 47, God zooms Ezekiel out to the future when the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Jesus, when he comes to rule on this earth for a thousand years and how the temple will be, how the river of God will run from under the temple. All the details are given in chapter 47. So now why am I saying all these things? Why am I saying all of these things? It matters we as a temple of God realize what God's true intention was when he was talking about the tabernacle, when he was talking about the temple. We are the living temple of God, the walking, talking temple of God, and we host the Holy Spirit in us. You know, we have this depth of understanding to come. God is gracious, you know, he allows his Holy Spirit to live in us and, and takes every worship we give to him just the way we are. And the Holy Spirit, even without we knowing, has guided us already on how the worship should be. We have lived it, we have experienced it. But coming to the knowledge of it just connects the dots and it makes you appreciate a little bit more. That's how it is. God has already given his spirit in us. We are already the temple. But when you start to read the tabernacle and how worship happened and how Jesus has fulfilled all of these things and why God wants us to be like a tabernacle of David, worship becomes all the more beautiful. You appreciate what Jesus has done all the more. And you start to know when I'm entering the presence of God, what am I supposed to be doing when I'm entering the presence of God? All these things start to become, make sense. So we're going to meditate the tabernacle of Moses or the tabernacle itself. And then we're going to see how David interacted in every area of this tabernacle. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 to 8, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets. In fact, I came to fulfill it. And when we worship God knowing all these things, yes, we are not under the law because Jesus has fulfilled every requirement of the law. But what we're doing here is just following the path and appreciating God. Yes, amen? Okay, let's go to the tabernacle and see what the tabernacle is about. So in the background, we'll just play a video, a 3D virtual video of what the tabernacle was like. It just helps us understand you know, what was in the tabernacle, what was um, the elements of worship that was. The tabernacle was in three parts, as most of us know. The outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. The holy place is also called the inner court at times. The outer court was open air. The inner court or the, most, the holy place was inside the tent. And the tent was divided in two parts. And behind the holy place is the most holy place. Now the outer court had two main elements called as the brazen altar or the altar of sacrifice and offerings. Then you have the bronze lava which had water in it. And then when you go into the holy place, there are three things, three main things that were there. On the north side was the table of showbread. And directly opposite to the altar of showbread was the menorah or the lampstand. And between these two was the incense of altar. This was in the holy place. And beyond the holy place, there were curtains. It's the most holy place. The most holy place did not have much furniture, it just had one. It's the Ark of the Covenant. So we're going to meditate what does it take to worship God in these three stages. Why did God 
have these patterns? Why are these things in the heavens? And why did God want this on the earth? And what does it mean for you and me? Do, when we pass through these, through these stages of worship. Remember, we are the temple of God. And we too have three parts to us. The outer court, which is our body. The inner court or the holy place, our soul. And the most holy place being our spirit. And worship happens in all these three stages. Let's see, how do we worship God? And we're going to be mindful of how David worshipped in these three stages. Because remember, the Lord said, I will raise up the tabernacle of David in the last days. Because you and I are the living tabernacles of God. And he wants worship in the fashion that David dared to do. David not being a priest, took a position of priest. David then not being a king, took the position of a king. And that is the calling that God has called each one of us to do. Amen. So, when we first come, how do we come into, into the outer court? What is the fashion that we have to come into the outer court? David said in Psalms chapter 100 verse 1. We sing this song. It's a lovely song, beautiful opening song. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Amen. This morning we entered his gates with thanksgiving in our heart and into his courts with praises and worship unto God. You don't simply walk into those curtains and enter the outer court. You come into his presence knowing who he is, the great I am, the great majesty, the king of kings and lord of lords. Lord, I come to worship you with a beautiful heart, with happiness, with a cheerful encounters. I come to worship you with purpose, with thanksgiving, with praise, with exaltation. David said, enter his gates with thanksgiving. That's how we enter into the outer court. Every time of prayer, every time of intimate time with God begins with worship of praise and thanksgiving unto God who has done marvelous things in our life. Once you enter the outer court, the very first thing that you would see is the altar of offering and sacrifices or also called as the brazen altar. The brazen altar is the place where every kind of sacrifice was done. Every kind of blood sacrifice was done. Every type of grain offering, every type of drink offering was done. The bare minimum was a lamb to be sacrificed in the morning and a lamb to be sacrificed in the evening. But in between that, there's hundreds and thousands of sacrifices that continually take place on this altar. The altar is filled with blood and the altar has fire. Because once the offering is done, the offering is burnt with fire. So every time we come to this altar, what do we do? We are not coming with lambs, we are not coming with goats and bulls as was required in the Old Testament. Our loving Savior has died and become the ultimate sacrifice. Hebrews says how Jesus is our sacrifice, how Jesus has fulfilled the law in becoming the sin offering for us. Amen. So David says beautifully about this. Let's read in Psalms chapter 51, verse 16 to 17. It says, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it you do not desire in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. David was a man who was familiar with sacrifices, but yet he knows the heart of God. And he says, God, you don't really want all this bloodshed because you have made the provision in Jesus for me. I don't no longer have to come with blood, but I come there with a contrite heart, with a heart of repentance. Every time we come into his presence after thanksgiving and worship, you remember the cross. 
you remember the sacrifice that was done the rose that was trampled we sang that so beautifully you gave yourself you were rejected by man you rejected by all you shed yourself on the cross drip by drip for me you made that cross my brazen altar unto god and all you do is come and stand before the brazen altar with a contrite heart lord wash me clean me with your blood let the blood of jesus be my righteousness you cannot worship god without going past the brazen altar you cannot come into his presence without acknowledging the blood of jesus without having a repentant heart without having the cleansing that comes with the blood of jesus because every time the blood was sacrificed there the priest would take the blood and sprinkle on that person who offered that sacrifice without the sprinkling of blood over you and me we cannot worship god and we come and stand there at the brazen altar and say god i appreciate i love you and thank you for the cross amen hallelujah secondly in the outer court the next element that is there is the bro- the bronze laver the bronze laver the bronze laver is like a basin with a stand and it's filled with water the priest would clean would put clean water in it every time it constantly renewed water what is that water for soon after the priest does the sacrifice remember he's got blood in his hands the effect of sin is still in his hand he goes and washes his hands and his feet he washes himself of the blood ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 jesus talks paul talks about how husband should love their wife and here he gives us insight he says christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present to her present her to himself as a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but she should be holy without blemish so before you enter to the next stage there is a washing that is required and here the washing is likened unto the word of god washing of the water by the word what does king david say about this in psalm 119 verse 9 it says how can a young man cleanse his way he asked how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word david knew that the washing was according to the word you might ask what does it mean washing according to the word the word of god that says every time that how you live god has forgiven you at the bronze brazen lay, brazen altar now you wash yourself with the word of god you renew yourself with the word of god you read the word of god and say god your word says that i must flee adultery i must abhor idolatry that i must live a righteous life that i should not steal i should not sin the word of god tells me and renews me cleanses me without spot or any wrinkle that you renew yourself by the word of god at the bronze and laver does it make sense it says god says washing by the word washing of water by the word so you take god's word and take every promise that says and every direction that the word of god says on how pure you should live on what on how you should acknowledge the right way of living the word of god that renews your mind renews you teaches you how to live right and you washed by the water that is the word of god amen so once you first come to the cross you come with thanksgiving and courts uh, thanksgiving and praise into the courts then you come to the cross and you acknowledge the cross you repent at the cross day after day 
Because just like how the altar has at least a minimum of two sacrifices in the morning and the evening, you come to the cross morning and night at least, and then you repent, renewing yourself, and then you read the word of God, and then you fashion to live according to the word of God because it instructs you on how to live in purity at the bronze and labor. Now once you have sorted sin, this is in the outer court. This is where sin gets sorted out. So this is in our body. Body being the outer court. Here you offer prayers of repentance. You, you, you offer prayers for help to live a holy life through the reading of word of God. You read the word of God and you pray it in the outer court. So sin is sorted out in the outer court. Sin happens in your body. Sin is sorted in the outer court. Next level you can go into the inner court or into the holy place. The holy place, to enter before the holy place, there are five pillars that stand and there are four curtain pieces between these five pillars. And then you enter into the holy place. Remember, this is within a tent. There is no natural light in this place. It's dark. The only light in this place is the lampstand that's there. On the north side is the table of the showbread. So the table of showbread is, has 12 loaves of unleavened bread, six on either side, and it's sprinkled with incense, and it's there on the altar, on, on the table. The 12 pieces of bread signifies the 12 tribes of Israel. Directly to opposite to that, you have the lampstand. The lampstand has seven, seven candlesticks, signifying the seven churches, which we read in the book of Revelation. So in the inner place, God shows both the church and Israel are both in the holy place. Both come through the common cleansing outside and they enter the holy place. God acknowledges both the church and Israel in the holy place. So let's see what, what is it, the table of showbread. What is the showbread? So, so the priest who looks after, who's on duty, would change the showbread once every week. On Sabbath day, they will bake this, these pieces of bread, which are unleavened flat bread, I believe, and then they will come and place it there. And there were very specific instructions on how much measurement should be each bread. It's two and a half ifa of flour or something like that with the right amount of oil, right amount of um, you know, salt and all that to be put in. Specifically, that bread will be baked and they'll, they'll be left there. This bread, once a week when it's taken away, is given to the priest to eat. The priest is allowed to eat this holy bread. This bread is also called the bread of the presence because this bread stays in the presence of God. And this bread, the priest is allowed to eat in a holy place, whether it be in the holy place or in the outer court, in a holy place, he can eat it. It's a provision unto the priest. What does it mean for us? Jesus said, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He also said, I am the bread of life, and he is the word of God. You see that the bread and the word is yet again symbolizing, being symbolized here. It means because the priest is allowed to take this bread and eat, this bread signifies it is for your sustenance. You can eat the bread of God. Man will not live by just eating normal food, but a man can live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Which means you can live your life, you can plan your life, you can live your day-to-day -day life based on the promises of God. God says, I will make you the head and not the tail. The word of God says, I am Jehovah Jireh, your provider. 
you say you take your word of god and say god you said you will surround me your angels will encamp me that will become your life the word of god the promises of god are the show bread for you so you saw in the bronze the bread and the bronze lever you took the same word of god and you started to apply for your purity and for your cleansing and now you take the word of god you pick out the promises the word of god and say god you promised this for my life this is how i'm going to live you promised me a good family life you said your your wife will be blessed your your children will be thought of the lord lord this is your promise towards me i claim this as my bread i will eat of this show bread in your presence and i will claim it for my life because that is for my sustenance as much as you gave it to the priest to live by that bread i take your bread your word of god and i will meditate on it i will make it my own i will confess it and i will live by it the just shall live by faith and faith in the word of god whether we have a job or not whether this world goes the way in good way or not we have the promises of god which is our assurance which is our sustenance amen you know we remember king david or his his way with the show bread when david and his men were running away from saul they came to the tabernacle one day and they were so hungry they had nothing to eat they go to the high pri- the priest who is in duty that day and asked him can do you have anything to eat do you have any weapons do you have anything to eat uh, me and my men are starved and the priest says i don't have anything i only have the show bread i've just swapped the show bread i've just put a fresh set of bread on the show bread show table but i only have this bread david is not supposed to eat it it's only meant for the priest but david knows his calling David knows if he doesn't live he cannot fulfill the plans of God so he says if God wants me to live God wants me to escape from Saul and become the king that he has appointed me to be then I got to eat this bread yes God will provide for me yes his bread which is meant for the priest the presence the bread of the presence is mine for my sustenance for my living I will eat this and I will live and proclaim the works of God amen so you and I are called to live and proclaim the word of God proclaim the works of god in our life so hence every promise of god is ours in christ jesus is yes and amen in christ jesus for us one of the questions that i used to have as a teenager is like how is this you know i grew up in a you know in a pastor's family and i was like you know we just take random words of god and say it's mine and like how does it work it was written for you know the israel israelites for the jewish people or for the corinthians or for the ephesians or whoever but how do i just go about taking the word of god and making it mine now i know how it is mine it says every scripture is for edification and for me so god has said the promises of the word of god is for you to claim at the show bread at the show bread table okay we're going to cross go across and see the lamp stand the lamp stand as i said it has seven wicks and it's made in one piece which means if you pour an and it has a reservoir and underneath the wicks uh, underneath the candles candles so if you pour oil in one of the in one of the candles it will just fill up every other the reservoir will fill and it will be always in equal level the seven seven um candles candlesticks so every day the priest is required twice a day to come and ensure that the wick is clean is cleaned up and the light burns so now the light the fire for this is brought from the altar of sacrifice and they come and put it up there on and light the lamp the lamp is the one that gives light for this area of of the holy place without that light it will be dark so what does this light signify jesus said i am the light of the world without jesus 
Worshipping God is in darkness. It's a place of confusion. It's a place of misunderstanding. The light, Jesus said, I am the light. And the light, in his light, we see how to worship God. Amen. King David knew this very well and he said, in Psalms 119 verse 105, it says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. You see, again, Jesus, the light of the world, Jesus, the word of God. Again, the word of God is the light here yet again. You saw the word of God in the bronze lever. You saw the word of God on the showbread. You see the word of God again as the light. But what does this signify? What does this part signify? This signifies, this time the word of God is your wisdom. He is your understanding. He is the light that will show your path. He is the light, your instruction for the future. He is the light that comes in every decision point. So the same word of God which is used for your purification, the same word of God which is for your sustenance, is the same word of God which is now as a light for your future. A light for your living. Your day-to-day -day decisions come through the word of God which is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Your path, wherever the God has written your path to be in this world, it comes by the enlightenment of the word. Now you see, there is a difference in this light. In all other places, you just use the water, you just eat the bread. But here, the light comes from the oil. The oil is the source of the light. So when we read, what is the oil? The oil signifies the Holy Spirit. The oil signifies the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon, upon me because he has anointed me. Anointing requires oil to bring the good news to the afflicted. And he sent me to bind the bro brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. So we see that the oil is the Holy Spirit. So now you see the word, the light, the Spirit of God, the Word and the Spirit of God combines together to give you direction in your life. To give instructions on every time you come to a decision point. You say, God, what am I supposed to do in this area? Whether I should take this job or not take this job. Should I move to this city or should I not? Is this place good for my children? Should I do this course or not? When every time you come to a decision point, his word will become a light unto your path. Amen. And this is combined with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives life. So John chapter 6 verse 63, it says, Jesus said this. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So now we have the word of God and the spirit of God combined together in the candlestick that gives you instructions for life. The candlestick represents the spirit of God and the word of God together providing you specific direction. So now as you read the word of God, you got to pray. So now we're thinking how we're going to worship, right? How we're going to worship God. First, we enter his courts with thanksgiving and with praise. And then we come to the cross. We repent. We appreciate God for what he, Jesus, for what he has done. We are sprinkled by the blood of Jesus. Then we open up our Bibles. And then we read the word of God. We read the word of God with the motive of improving ourselves, to becoming pure, to live right, to surrender there. And then we take the promises of God at the showbread. And then we say, God, I claim this for my life. The, for every need of my life, I, you claim the same word of God while you're reading it. And then you get on your knees and you start praying the word of God. And the spirit of God combines with the word that you have read and he will start to provide directions. So this is where you come, in the, in, in, the, in the holy place. There is one more furniture in the holy place. Between the lampstand and 
and the table of showbread, right in the middle is the altar of incense. The altar of incense, as you know, is a place where incense is constantly raised unto God. Here the priest will combine four different spices together and he will burn it on the altar. Again, the fire for the altar is taken from the brazen altar outside. Fire is brought in there and it is burnt. And here sweet aroma rises unto God in this place. Remember, in the outer court, it's smelling of blood. It is smelling of burnt wood, burnt skin, burnt flesh. It's not a pleasant place in the outer court. But to mask the effects of sin, there is an incense that goes before the altar of God. Before his presence, there is incense that is constantly burning. This incense has to be continually raised. The priest needs to ensure that the fire and the incense are continually raised. What does this signify? This signifies intercessory prayer. The altar of incense signifies intercessory prayer. For those of you who are familiar with the Old Testament, you will remember in Numbers chapter 16 verse 48, when the children of Israel sinned against God, and God sent a plague to destroy them. Moses asked Aaron to take the censer, put some incense in it, and run among the people, pleading before God and said, God, please stop the plague. And everywhere Aaron ran, the plague stopped. And right at that point, 14,700 people died in a matter of minutes or even hour. I'm not sure how long, but it, it was pretty fast. But when the intercessor ran with the incense in his hand, interceding, he stood, the, the word of God says in Numbers chapter 1648, he stood between the living and the dead. He was the dividing point. Here, this one divides the tabernacle into two parts. And you stand at the altar of incense, offering up prayers of, prayers of intercession unto God. Intercessory prayer is a powerful prayer. Because it requires a, both incense and fire. And I'm just going to tell you, incense is nothing else but your own heart. Where you, you allow the incense to be broken. You allow your heart to be broken. Where you take the burden of God, God in your heart. And you cry to God. And you pray. And the fire signifies the Holy Spirit. The fire of the Holy Spirit and your broken heart. Combining together at the altar of incense. Offers beautiful incense or intercessory prayer unto God. And, you know John said. I baptize you with, with water, but Jesus will baptize you with what? With the Holy Spirit and with fire. The fire of the Holy Spirit and a broken heart coming together at the altar of incense, offering up intercessory prayers unto God for your own family, for yourself as God. I intercede for my life. David, David Prayed that prayer. You know, when we read um, Psalms, there is a Psalm which he says, he cries to God and he says, God, I, I plead for myself. You have Psalm 35 verse 1. Um, it says, plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. He pleads for himself. So you can plead for yourself in an intercessory prayer. And then you pray for your family, for your children, for your, for your work, for your church, for your pastor, for the, the ch church members. Those, whoever God gives you a burden, wherever the God, God puts a burden in your heart, that's where you come. But you've got to combine it with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8, he says, it's a spirit that prays with groanings that cannot be uttered. So here you come with a broken heart, with a burden in your heart, and then you ask the Holy Spirit, fire of God, ignite me with the words that I'm going to pray, with the words that I'm going to utter in your presence. Let the Holy Spirit and your word combine together and become a beautiful instance before God. And here you are praying the prayer 
for others and for yourself. And when you think what Jesus does, this is a very important ministry, a very important part of every believer's life. People just think intercessory prayer is a ministry set for certain people. Or some particularly kind of liken to the women of the church coming together and they have intercessory prayer. That's because I grew up in a Pentecostal background. All I remember is a group of ladies come on Thursday mornings and they have intercessory prayer. And that's my thought of intercession. But that's not the case. God wants every believer in your true form of worship. Intercessory prayer is part of it. So you come before the throne and you cry out for this nation. God, when will you touch Australia? Cry out for Ukraine. Cry out for Russia. Whatever the Lord puts in your mind, because the Holy Spirit will put thoughts in your head to pray, you raise up this incense before the altar. Right then. Amen. Hallelujah. And as the incense supposed to be continual, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. How many alls are there in that verse? So, God's expectation, if you were to follow the tabernacle of David's pattern, is you plead unto God at the tabernacle of, at the, at the altar of incense. Because Jesus himself, right now, as we know, there's a tabernacle in heaven. Right? There's a tabernacle right now in heaven. And what does Jesus do? The ministry of Jesus is the ministry of intercession. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. He read, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So the ministry of Jesus in heaven right now is intercession. He has his blood in his hand and he offers prayers for you and me. Many times when we went through hardships, when we did not know a person to pray for us, because I've been in that place when I knew nobody in this place, in this country when I first came, when I didn't want to tell situations to my parents, I know the Holy Spirit prayed for me. Many times when I woken up in my sleep speaking in tongues, and I knew, I have heard the Holy Spirit pray within me many a times. And that is the ministry of Jesus. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit within us. So let's, so let's see. In this area, we are operating in the realm of the soul. Right? Outer court was your realm of your body. And now you're operating in the realm of the soul. You read and confess the word of God. As the showbread, you read and pray in the spirit at the altar. And you read, sorry, read and pray in the Holy Spirit for directions in your life. And then you pour out your heart and pray with the Holy Spirit, intercessory prayer. This place pretty much consumes most of your time in your prayer life. This place takes so much of your time. You cannot come to this place, you know, I've got five minutes, Lord, I've got to run away. This, this place is very important because if you do this place very well, only then you can go to the next phase. Because if you haven't done the stage one and stage two well, there is no way you are going to go into the most holy place. Because, I'll tell you why. Because the most holy place is a place where it's pitch dark. If you don't carry the spirit of God within you and you come there, you will find nothing because it's just dark. You know what ignites the most holy place is the glory of God. The glory of God is the light in the most holy place. To enter his glory, you have to come with thanksgiving and praise. To enter his glory, you cannot bypass the cross and repentance and the washing and of the water and the promises of the bread of God and the light of the Holy Spirit and intercessory prayer. You condition your heart. You're so full of the word of God. Three times you have gone through the word of God and you have been praying in the spirit, praying in tongues, at the altar of incense, 
praying in tongues as you stand in the lamp stand you're so full of the word of god and is so full of the holy spirit only then you can enter the most holy place if you don't do the all these paths you can come there and you you would wouldn't find the glory of god that place wouldn't mean anything to you but if you have done this you will see the presence of god the glory of god which came and stood in the tabernacle you read in the bible every time moses entered the tent the the the, the presence the glory of god was visibly seen over the tent and when solomon dedicated the temple in the most holy place the glory of god descended and people could not stand his glory that is where you and me are called to be and we are called to be the temple this is where we are hosting the presence the glory of god isn't it scary and amazing at the same time to carry the presence of god in this living vessel amen hallelujah so to enter the holy most holy place you have four pillars and there are curtains on that there is emblems of cherubims and then when you enter inside all you have there as i said is the ark of the covenant the ark of the covenant is of a piece of furniture which has two cherubims have the wings covered over covering in between what is called an elevated little space on the box kind of thing it's called the mercy seat the mercy seat is where the presence of god dwells like a pillar of cloud that stands up the glory of god is there so in in the ark i'll just slowly go so you got two cherubims that's covering and this is a quiet place it's a still place here you don't have to do anything in in the in the show bread you had bread to eat at the lamp stand you had directions to ask in the altar of incense you were praying for others and for yourself but once you come into the holy most holy place you are in the presence of the almighty god here prayers cease here confession cease everything becomes silent you just stand in awe or you bow down in awe in his presence you just breathe in his presence you just stay there the only thing that you do there is come with the blood of jesus once a year the priest the mo- the high priest only once a year he will bring blood and put it on the mercy seat and most likely he would bow down and stay in the presence of god and he would leave if he is a man who is not worthy who has not done the other stages right the glory of god will kill him the glory of god will actually kill him and and in those days they actually tied a rope on the most high priest hip when he went into the most holy place because they can't collect a dead body out from a most holy place and they will drag him out in case something happened to him so now we come into this most holy place with reverence and honor i don't know if most of us would have gone through this experience where you pray you intercede you confess and suddenly you would be in awe of god's presence how many of you have gone through that you know you just don't know what to do now you know you just like even tongues you won't even be speaking tongues or anything you just stay still in god's presence you just in awe of him you just bow down and worship him words would not come you would just be there quietly soaking in his presence and that is the experience of the most holy place and you bow down in front of him knowing in the most holy place everything is provided for you because in the ark of the covenant in underneath the mercy seat or inside the box there are three things one is a pot of manna second there are the 10 commandments third is the 
rod of Aaron that budded. So there are these three important things that are in the most holy place. Sorry, I lost my notes there. So when, when you come in his presence, the pot of manna signifies God's provisions, his supernatural provision for you. So God fed the children of Israel for 40 years with manna. Thus, his provisions are there for you in his presence. Supernatural provision, not a bread that you make and then you eat outside. It is a supernatural provision that comes only from his presence. Secondly, you have the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, the Lord says, I, I will write, yeah, the Ten Commandments is the guidance for your life. And the Lord said in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 16, which is taken from Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 33. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart and in their minds I will write them. In those days God gave the Ten Commandments to be in his presence. But now where is the Ten Commandments? God has written that in your very heart. So when you come to his presence, there is divine provision in the pot of manna. Then there is a law that is written in your heart already by, by, by the Lord under the new covenant. And then you have the rod of Aaron which budded. What was this rod used for? For every sign and wonder. Before Pharaoh, the Lord used the rod of Aaron to show signs and wonders. The rod that was over the Red Sea. The rod that struck the rock that brought forth water. The rod that showed signs and wonders. The rod of authority is in his presence. When you come to the presence of God, you have every authority over every demon, every sickness, every work of the enemy, every natural disaster. God has given you the power and the authority just like the rod of Aaron. You come into his presence and you soak in his presence where the glory of God is as you stand in his presence you've got nothing else to do. He supernaturally provides for you. He writes his commandments, his guidance is within you, within your heart. He's inscribed it there. And his authority, he said, I give you power over every demon and every work of the enemy. You will trample over serpents and scorpions. And I give you power over every work of the enemy. Isn't that the authority that Jesus gave us? Amen. David has been in the most holy place. Because, you know, he, he keeps writing in his Psalms. If you read Psalm 61, verses 3 to 4, it says, For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from my enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever, and I will trust in the shelter of your wings. What wings is he talking about? The wings of the cherubim. He says, under your wings, O Lord, I come for shelter. I come to your tabernacle and I come to you right under the, under the Ark of the Covenant, under the shelter of your wings. Psalm 57 verse 1, he says, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. So in your time of trouble, just like how David did, you can walk into the most holy place. And under the shadow of his wings, just like how David found shelter and provision and authority and, um, uh, and law in his presence, it is given to you. But you know what? You are called to easily come into the throne of grace. You are called easily to come, come into the throne of grace. David would have just dreamed of this. He wrote of this prophetically. But he himself 
could not just walk into the the most holy place whenever he wanted he has to go to a specific place in a specific location with so many sacrifices pass through all those things yet as a priest he couldn't even though he did he couldn't do it as often as you and i can do at any time any time of the day in any location you can do this what david couldn't do god has given to you so freely hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 Let's read that. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need we are called to come to the throne room of god to the most holy place where priests dread to come and risk their lives now you are just invited with open arms with open doors when jesus died on the cross the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place was divided that was his flesh that is what we read in hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 to 25 when you read it says his body was that was torn as a flesh made way for you to come to the most holy place you the temple of god you know one thing that is common in all these three places is the blood of jesus the blood that priest sprinkled on all instruments on on the altar on the laver into the show bread and the candlestick and the incense of altar finally the mercy seat everywhere the blood was sp- sprinkled and the next thing is the word of god the word of god the blood the word of god and the spirit of god combining with you will take you to the most holy place So now we are the temple of the most high god and his purpose is for his glory to dwell within our spirits your spirit signifies the most holy place true worship happens when the spirit of god interacts with your spirit a time of intimacy when god the father and the son and the holy spirit meet the body soul and your spirit the meeting place is in the most holy place and god doesn't expect anything less because if you are his temple worship has to happen the right way worship has to happen the right way maybe we didn't know much like how i had my calculator for years until i entered engineering similarly you know now we know how god expects and how the times the sacrifices were done morning and in the evening and some the prayers continually let's learn from this and say god let me honor you with this body let me honor you with this temple I will come into your presence with thanksgiving and I will worship you in the true form that you expect Lord because your plans and your patterns have not changed if there is a tabernacle in heaven till date yes Lord I will maintain the tabernacle within me it is not something of the old that is gone if there is a tabernacle in heaven and if he called you to be the temple his plans and his intents and his patterns have not changed i ask the worship team to come forward we're going to worship the lord for some time we're going to worship him for he's worthy of worship for the, for the dwelling of a god is amongst men why he loves us so much What is man that you consider him so much Lord David asked that question who am i that you will consider me why do you want to put your spirit in me why do you want to have communion with me because he loves you nothing else he loves you 
He just wants to be with you. He wants to have a mishkan in you. He wants to have a dwelling place in you. Oh, with what reverence. With what duty do we carry this, this responsibility? Lord, if you want to raise up the tabernacle of David in us, the true form of worship, with praise and adoration and repentance, a broken heart, we will come before you, Lord. We surrender ourselves. Let's rise up to our feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He has made me glad. to come that you will walk through the tabernacle with us that the cross and the blood of Jesus and your Holy Spirit will dwells in us bring us to a place of seeing your glory Moses asked Lord after seeing him in the tabernacle many times he said Lord show me your glory Show me your glory. He could not have enough of God's glory. God had to hide him in a place of a rock and showed him his glory, only his backside. He gives it so freely to you. Moses didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. David didn't have the constant indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They sought him with all their heart. They longed after him, ran after him. That which the prophets waited and longed for. The Lord has so beautifully and freely given it to you. They would have loved to have a day in your life. All the provisions of the cross. All the provisions of a mediator in heaven. All the provisions of walking into the throne room of God. Don't take this lightly, church. Don't take this lightly. Let's say, Lord, let me see your glory. Hide me under your wings, O oh God. Let me dwell there. Let me dwell in your tabernacle. You dwell in me and I dwell in you. Isn't this what Jesus was talking about? You abide in me and I, my words abide in you. Then you will bear much fruit. Let your spiritual life come to a life through this experience. In a place of constant surrender. A place of constant surrender. Thank you, Lord. 
the lord is reminding me that there's somebody here who's constantly struggling with guilt constantly struggling with guilt the lord says again to you lay it at my cross don't carry the burden that you don't have to carry i have paid it for you i have paid it all for you ri ma si andara bashi let it go i have forgiven you let it go let it go says the lord carry it no more i have cast it to the midst of the sea and i remember it no more says the lord ri ma si akalo bashi andara I thank you Lord hallelujah thank you for the cleansing of your word this morning thank you for the cleansing of your word this morning thank you for the show bread oh lord thank you for your promises that are yes and amen in Christ Jesus thank you lord you are my sustenance you by you i live i move and have my being oh god i thank you for the show bread thank you for the counsel at the lamp stand thank you for enlightening my eyes oh lord Every time when I need decision your holy spirit directs me through your word. I thank you for your word oh God. Thank you for the provision of the altar of incense that I can cry with you holy spirit and seek the father for grace. Thank you for the provision of the altar of incense oh God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the ark of the covenant. Thank you for your presence oh God. Lord I pray each one of our prayer life will change going forward knowing how we offer you service in this temple be magnified in our life oh god in jesus name i pray amen praise god amen what a beautiful word god has spoken to us through dear sister our dear father god we thank you so much for revealing to us lord what it means to have a tabernacle of david in our midst lord in our presence in our lives thank you so much for revealing it to us god of lord what it means to truly enter into your courts enter into your into your presence god lord we are so thankful to you for the holy spirit that is with us and in us lord to guide us to direct us to open the word to us lord to show us the path when we are lost lord to get, reveal to us lord the things the mysteries of um, that you have held shut for a long time god we thank you so much lord because of supernatural provision in our lives lord we thank you for miracles lord we thank you for healings we thank you for all the blessings that we have even safety under the shelter of your wings father we give you all glory honor and praise we thank you once again for blessing us with your holy spirit presence in this place be with us lord as we go out from here and lord let your let your presence always be in our lives god as david as king david um uh, did whenever he was in in trouble he always ran to you and he always took counsel from you he always came back to you no matter how big his army was no matter what um how, how many what uh, riches he had what provision he had he always came back to you as a dear friend as a father lord i thank you that you will be with us in this week to guide us and to lead us into the pastures that you have seen us as uh, you have uh, seen for us we thank you so much lord once again we give you glory honor and praise in jesus name we ask and we pray amen